Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this professional lunch of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I'm Anthony Rowley, a former president of the club, and it's my pleasure to act as moderator today and to welcome our two guests. Um, to my immediate right is Dr. Ian Bremer, who is um, founder and president of the Eurasia Group, which is described as a leading or the leading global political risk research and consulting firm. And to his right is Takashi Mitachi, who is co-chairman of the Japan office of the Boston Consulting Group. Both of them are co-authors of a forthcoming book, which is entitled The Age of Geoeconomics, in which you can see here, which was published last week in Japanese. And there's another book on its right, which is called Superpower, which was written by Dr. Bremer. And I'm sure they'll be uh, talking about the contents of that, too. Um, Mr. Ian Bremer has spoken, as you all know, many times at this club, um, and I hope that he'll forgive me if I um, refer you to the uh, concise summary of his career and, and um, achievements, which is contained in the flyer for today. As for Mitachi-san, um, he was a member of the Boston Consulting Group's Worldwide Executive Committee for many years, until 2013. And um, prior to that, he, he worked um, in Japan Airlines uh, in a number of executive positions for 14 years. He's also been vice chairman of the Japan Association of Corporate Executives and a member of the World Economic Forum's General Agenda Council on, ne on Geoeconomics. Okay, well, what is geoeconomics? Um, it's tempting to, to shorten it to geonomics, but I'm told that that's, that doesn't quite cut it. Um, I won't go into this because we have two experts here to discuss this, um, and uh, Matachi-san will speak first. Um, so, without wasting any more time, I will ask Mitachi-san to begin his address. Let me just ask you, uh, please, to switch off your cell phones or put them onto silent mode as a courtesy to our speakers. So, please join me in welcoming today's two speakers. Thank you. So, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk in front of this uh, uh, in a sense, a daunting task for me uh, is that to talk in front of uh, those experts right here. Uh, this is the third time for me to come here, but not speaking in the professional luncheon. So it's uh, stimulating to me, but exciting to me. Uh, Ian and I met, I think, seven years ago in one of the Davos meeting, where we have discussed uh, many things about East Asian politics and uh, also instability which can uh, lead to global instability starting right here. And we disagreed many things, but uh, I forgot what we disagreed. But we agreed upon the fact that China, Korea, and Japan is where the potential growth of the world economy could come from, but at the same time, potential geopolitical risk could arise. It was well before the time of Senkaku Daiyu issues uh, got more prevalent right now. We are now uh, working. Uh, as co-working with the uh, World Economic Forum's Agenda Council on Geoeconomics. Geoeconomics is the world uh, to the juxtaposition of geopolitics and economics, but more to the fact that interlink uh, influence with each other of political motive and economic policy. It's getting more and more stronger right now. Many of my clients right here talk about competitive risks, particularly digital disruption. But the maybe 50, 60 percent of their performance is really relied upon non-competitive risks. I will just show you the small, oh, I don't know how I can proceed. Do you have any clicker or something like that? Sorry, I can't just move. Can't just move the page. I was wondering if uh, someone have a clicker. It's frozen. That's okay. I think, uh, for example, I, as as I was introduced, worked for Japan Airlines for 14 years. In the 1970s and 80s, where I worked there, the golden sum, the rule of thumb, was that every 10 years there is a huge shock, and which can sort of wipe off uh, 10 to 15 percent of revenue uh, industry-wide, like uh, Iran-Iranian war, 
like the case of uh, uh, many hijacking, well, happened globally. Maybe, can we? Yeah. Ah, there, we go. there we go. But the right now, it's every three years or so, there are something which could uh, actually cause a huge volatility in revenue and profit of the airline industry. This is an aggregate of top 20 airlines in the world that uh, you don't have to worry too much about the details, but uh, there was a Gulf War and then Asia uh, financial crisis and 9-11 SARS, Lehman Shock and Fukushima, which actually made uh, the industry profit, you know, maybe wiped off by the order of 20 or 25 percent per annum. It's nothing to do with competition against low-cost carriers, competition among the alliances. It's beyond competition. So we all know that uh, when you seriously talk about the business planning and strategy, non-competitive risks matters a lot and geopolitical slash geoeconomic risk is even more important. If you're thinking about uh, to protect your IP rights in one of the emerging countries, there is a certain tendency if the government of that emerging country is going to control uh, your IP just because they would like to uh, put the influence over your uh, country of domicile. So there are certain governments, frankly speaking, plural of them, are now utilizing economic policy uh, in lieu of political measures to influence over their counterparts. One of the reasons we believe that it's worthwhile to write on this book is Japan included, East Asia, is where the cent of, should be the focal point of geoeconomics, in a sense. And uh, unfortunately, having served a Japanese corporation for more than 20 years, a literacy level of geopolitics among the business leaders when compared with uh, Western counterparts are quite low, frankly speaking. So one of the reasons we started was to lay out the context and what matters and what we should, we should do to interpret the current geopolitical situation and is precisely that to boost up the literacy level of Japanese business leaders on this subject matter. Particularly of importance to me, uh, being a risk fellow, I'm mean the fellow on risk management for Boston Consulting Group globally, uh, is that there are certain tendencies among Japanese corporations. Japanese corporations are pretty good at doing the Kaizen type of risk management. When they do experience something, including natural disaster, they are pretty good at doing the thorough review and trying to prepare for the next time. I always start talking about this 210 divided by 34, meaning that uh, 210 years starting 1800 to 2009, there were 34 disastrous earthquakes in Japan. Uh, according to the disaster, uh, uh, disaster experts, an earthquake caused more than 50 lives. It's called disastrous earthquakes. There were 34 of that, meaning that every six year or so, huge trembling of the earth and the casualty caused in Japan. And uh, I was asked by my friend uh, in travel tourism department, Japanese government, that I'm not supposed to talk about it uh, in front of uh, foreign correspondences because it would uh, damage our inbound boom, uh, knowing that every six years there is something still. But still, I, I just can't talk about it because it is now ingrained to Japanese culture, even to the corporation, that we know that something would, coming, would be coming each six years and the typhoons put aside. So things would surely come, and when you do have some disasters and the damages, you would do better next time. For example, in 1923, there was a great Kanto earthquake, Kankodo Daishinsai. The very next year, Japanese government put the first registration in the world on architectural regulations against quakes. Quake proof is the prerequisite to build house, buildings, anything. This was very first in the world. 
In 1959, Ise-1 typhoon, Ise-bay typhoon caused 6,000 lives lost. And uh, even though Japan was uh, such a, a poor country, Japan put the first uh, Japan space radar on top of Mount Fuji. Japan was reliant on uh, US troops on any of the detection of the typhoon. So they did want to do themselves and put the satellite up on the orbit. In 1995, we had the Great Hanshin earthquake. We know that uh, this time, uh, 2011, uh, Tohoku Shinkansen bullet trains, there were 23 bullet train lines up and running, some over 200 kilometers per hour. And every one of them either stopped or slowed down uh, b uh, below 20 kilometers per hour speed before the actual shock wave came. Why? There was a seismic detection system which captured the RE signal 50 kilometers north, uh, uh, east of uh, Tohoku Shinkansen, and then within 60 seconds, automatic brake stopped the 23 blood planes. If it were not for that, there's a huge number of casualties. So we learned that it was only built after 1995's Kobe Hansen earthquake. But everyone here knows that what happened with Fukushima. Apparently, there was kind of a, a cultural norm that you don't have to think about the unthinkables. Japanese corporations and cultures and societies are not very good at thinking about unthinkable. Try to prepare for something which we haven't, uh, at least in our lives, experienced. We know that there was the similar magnitude of huge tsunami 1,000 years ago, but apparently it's beyond our imagination, and which stopped uh, Tokyo Electricity, the others, to be prepared for that level of tsunami after the earthquake. So I think one of the reasons I was really into writing the book with Ian on this one is that uh, we need to think about unthinkable. I'm not saying that there is going to be a, a geopolitical disaster for sure next five years. I'm not sure, but I don't think so. But if there is a 5 percentage point of probability of something uh, dramatic could happen in this region, Japanese corporations and society and government should be pre-think about it and prepare for about it so that we could be more resilient in terms of uh, geopolitical disorders in these regions. Obviously, there are, uh, let's say, many more things to, uh, so that uh, we could be prepared, uh, particularly knowing that uh, most of Japanese manufacturers are doing their businesses globally. Supply chains are really linked globally. So we need to boost up the literacy ratio. If you talk uh, one of those, uh, let's say, CEOs or CSOs, asks them how much time they do spend uh, in terms of uh, thinking about geopolitical risks and non-competitive risk in their mid-term plan, say five-year plan of any corporation. We are involved so deeply, maybe less than 5%. Most of the time, they talk about their cost, their positioning vis-a-vis -vis their competitors, but not necessarily non-competitive risk, including the geopolitical risks. I think that should be changed, and we hope that we are going to have made a very small first step toward the stronger, more religious Japanese corporations and society. Uh, without further ado, I think I would ask Ian to talk more about the meat of the contents and his latest thinking about geopolitics and uh, economics and the interlinkage about it between the two. Please. Sure. Okay, thank you, um, Natasha san um, You remind me that um, for a while after Fukushima here, moderators would say that if this building starts shaking, please uh, make an orderly um, progression to the stairs and don't attempt to use the elevator, but we seem to have um, given up that particular yeah. bit of preparation. Now. Okay, uh, Dr. Bremer, please. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks. It's great to be back here. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what number of time it is giving a talk, but it's always a highlight uh, because uh, I'll try to talk for a short period of time so we can have a, a long uh, time to engage with all of you. Um, journalists ask the best questions. Um, the 
Matachasan is a very dear friend, and when he first suggested we do this because he thought that the geopolitics were indeed becoming much more uh, unstable, uh, the creative destruction that I call the G0 that we uh, I coined five years ago, but is clearly much more upon us and with us now uh, than, than it was at that time, uh, he thought a focus specifically on Asia, uh, which clearly is the part of the world that is most going to matter in terms of our long-term economic and political development as a planet, and yet is an area that is getting so little of the headline focus, at least in my part of the world, when everyone is saying ISIS, no Russia, no Europe, no everything in the Middle East, right? I mean, we, we did a pivot to Asia and then so much for that, right? So I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about all of those headline issues, um, and, and I know Matachi san will as well, um, when we get to Q&A, because I, I don't want to pretend that I'm here and you don't care about refugees or Syria or ISIS. But for my, my remarks, I'd like to focus really on, on the topic of this book, which is the geoeconomics. And I think I want to say a, a couple of things. First, in terms of thinking about the unthinkable. The unthinkable, is that China is not really primarily a geo-security threat. It is an economic threat. Um, and not just to Japan, but to everybody. Um, they are going to be the largest economy in the world in relatively short order. And when they become the largest economy, they will still be comparatively poor, they will still be authoritarian. They will still be state capitalist. One of the most interesting stats out there: that take the five, uh, the, uh, the the what is the the 500 largest companies in the world, and uh, 10 years ago, some 9% were state-owned enterprises. Last year, that was 23%. Can easily see that being 50% or more by the time China is the largest economy. I wrote a book about 10 years ago called eight years ago called The End of the Free Market. And a lot of Americans gave me hell for that. Because they said, what, what, what are you, a socialist? What are you, a Canadian? The end of the free market? <laughs> what are you talking about? And I'm like, no, if the world's largest economy is not a free market economy, you have the end of a global free market, right? And all you need to do is look at the IMF putting the RMB into reserve currency special drawing right status yesterday larger piece of the global IMF basket than the yen, just like that, right? And, and you ask yourself, we're going to be in a hybrid system. How are we going to deal with that? Now, the reason I mention that's kind of the unthinkable, because when I talk to CEOs and when Matachi-san talks to CEOs, none of them are talking about this, about how fundamentally their business models will need to change when the world is no longer a global free market system. Now, the reason... I think that's important is, number one, because this is not, you know, sort of a fat tail risk. This is baseline. This is going to happen. It's like climate change. And the reason I'm paying less attention to climate change is because the impact of what governments do in Paris in the next two weeks on our global climate in the next 30 years is a tiny percentage of what's going to happen to our world compared to what happens in technology and what happens with actual climate with feedback effects and the rest. In other words, it's already gotten too far. Where the, I'm not saying we shouldn't try. Of course we should. Um, I'm just saying that you know, there's not much as governments we're going to do to derail that. Where the way we react to this transition from a nominally US-led free market economy to one that is hybrid, that's one that our governments can actually determine whether or not we are at peace, at war, or anywhere in between. So I, I think that's one we should probably pay a lot of attention to. Um, and, I, and believe me, I'm not a climate skeptic. <laughs> I'm an adherent. I just know that the cat's out of the box on that one, right? Um, the, one of the biggest challenges, I guess two things I want to say specifically for a Japanese audience here or Japan-based audience here. Um, it, number one, I think I would say that the uncertainty for Japan around what US foreign policy is going to be for you over the next five years is probably dramatically greater 
than the real uncertainty of what Chinese foreign policy is going to be for you. I don't think anyone understands that yet, right? I mean, the reality that there is a debate in the United States about do, does the US want to have a significant leadership role and what does that mean? Or do they want to become much more isolationist and what does that mean? Is real. Where China kinda has a five year plan, they are quite stable with it. They, it is economically led. Their security issues will be regional and also take a back seat to the economics. And furthermore, there's not much reason to believe that's gonna change dramatically over the next few years. This is particularly challenging for Japan because if you wanna look at the next 10 to 20 years, the uncertainty around what China is in the world is dramatically greater than that of the United States. When you look at things like demographic sustainability, political demands for liberalization, the environment, the impact of technology, the US as a marketplace, the US as a player globally in that regard is actually much less likely to move in dramatic directions than the Chinese over that larger period. I think it's hard for the Jap, it's gonna be hard for the Japanese to react to that. So that's one first big point. La second big point is that the United States is obviously much more powerful economically than the Chinese. And you see that um, when you look at the size of banks, when you look at the importance of the US dollar as the reserve currency, when you look at the size of the economy and all of that. And yet, we call this book geoeconomics, which is a pretty wonky term that not a lot of people know. And the reason we did that is because the United States is fully capable of responding to geopolitical challenges around the world. They don't always want to. Syria is a geopolitical challenge. Russians opposing an additional one. The Americans certainly have military capabilities if they want to engage them. Doesn't mean they'll do it well. Doesn't mean they want to do it at all. But they can. They know how, right? Geoeconomics, the Americans don't actually have the tools. They've got the size. They've got the power, but they don't have the tools. And what do I mean by that? Single most unnerving thing out there as an American today, for me, looking at the world, is not ISIS, it's not Syrian refugees. These are horrible things. Single most unnerving thing is there's one major economy in the world today with a global strategy, and it's China. It's not the United States. Um, you look at the fact that when the Americans tell the Chinese, we don't like what you're doing on cyber, you're stealing a bunch of intellectual property, we're gonna sanction you before the Xi Jinping summit, and the Chinese response is, no you're not. And by the way, we're gonna organize a summit with all of your IT CEOs right before we meet with Obama in your country. They're all gonna come and they're all gonna tell us how much they wanna do business with their country. And Washington can do nothing about that. The fact that Congress has suspended the mandate for the Exim Bank. The, the fact that the United States government um, is not aligned with its private sector. The State Department is very strong. I would argue that today the State Department is the most effective foreign service in the world today. The British used to be, they've gutted it. No longer gets the funding and it's going down every day. Uh, certainly when you look at the Pentagon, you'd say the same thing, right? You may not, you may not like what it does, but the efficiency and effectiveness is absolutely there. The Department of Commerce, you would not say that in the United States. That's where, you, you know, you, you want, if you have a child and your child ends up in the State Department, you think that's a great thing. You have a child that ends up in commerce, you're like, that must be a middle child, right? You don't know what happened to that child. That is not, I'm sorry if there's someone here from commerce, is there? <laughs> good, okay, we're good. Um, and, uh, right, I mean, the, the commerce is not many. And, and it is not, I mean, Department of Energy is separate. U.S. trade, clearly much more effective, very small, also separate. The U.S. does not do industrial policy. The Chinese are writing checks. They're doing a Marshall Plan. The Brits, the special relationship with the United States. I was just there and I met with the entire leadership and I gotta tell you, I was stunned to see them tell me that, you know, South China Sea's far away. We're not really a major security player. We need infrastructure. 
the Chinese are prepared to help pay for it. We can't pay for it. We want to be China's best friend in the West. I mean, so it sounds like there is a special relationship that the Brits are, are aspiring to. It's not with the U.S. Boy, that's a different world. And, and that's a different world because geoeconomics are different than geopolitics. And the Americans can play geopolitics, and they'll play it for their advantage, and maybe that'll be to Japan's advantage, and maybe it won't be over time. But geoeconomics, the Americans are not good at. They don't know how to play. And the Chinese have their own Marshall Plan. They're going to spend over a trillion dollars. They're going to write checks, and they're going to get things in return. And that's why the Americans got their clock cleaned on the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And you'll see this as well over time with the one belt, one road policy. That you know the, the ability and the willingness of the Chinese to go around the world with the CEOs of state-owned enterprises and privately owned national champions and say, here's what we're gonna do for your country and here's what we want in return. Yes, there'll be backlash. Absolutely, you know, the lack of human rights, the relatively poor management, the export of capital, which of course, of, of, uh, of labor, which will go away over time because of the Chinese demographic challenges. There will certainly be people in countries, it can be Brazil, it can be Zambia, who will say, we don't like this Chinese capital. We want to turn it away. It's a problem for our country. For every person that does that, there's 100 that wants the cash. Let's not forget that. I'm not saying that the Chinese are malicious. I'm not saying they're evil. I'm not saying they're bad. In fact, at that level of development, they're doing a fantastic job. Democracy in China would be a huge problem for the United States above all. It's not that. It's that the reality of a radically different system in China of political and economic values and the ability to do industrial policy. In fact, the fact that geoeconomics is what makes China tick, where geopolitics is what makes America tick, and Japan is right in the middle, is absolutely the top issue out there for executives that have to think about the unthinkable over the next five to 20 years. So that's why we did the book. That's my 15 minutes, maybe 18, I'm sorry if, if it was. And, uh, and now it's to you. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Very thought-provoking. Um, okay, I would normally say uh, who wishes to ask the first question, but today I'm going to say who wishes to disagree first. <laughs> um, so, working press first. For questions, please. Yes, Joel, I think. Oh, no, sorry. No. Sorry, you are working press, are you not? No. Ah, well, I thought you were. Yes, sorry, Reuters here, please. Aaron Charlotte Reuters, thank you both for those uh, interesting comments. So you think um, uh, you think that they're gaining, getting the renminbi into a reserve currency with the IMF is essentially the sort of takeoff point for China's geo, global geo, uh, geo economic strategy. Is that is that what you're saying? And if you are, can you enlarge on it a bit more, please? And um, sorry, if I didn't introduce myself, okay. Aaron Sheldrick from Reuters. Yeah, yeah, no thanks. Um, I, I, I would not, not the takeoff point. I think the takeoff point has been coming for quite some time. It's just becoming, again, the, the, the takeoff, any, any place you want to look at, it's getting bigger and bigger. I mean, the AIB would be a good place to start, um, you know, in terms of the ability of the Chinese to actually get pretty much every country around the world to sign on to it after the Americans said, no, you don't or else, and with the exception of the Japanese, other countries saying actually, yeah, we're gonna be a part of this because you know we, we need alternatives. There's a lot of hedging behavior. Um, I think when the Dutch decided that they were gonna go to Huawei to help with their internet backbone, despite the fact that they're a NATO country, and the view being, well, you know, Snowden shows us that everyone's gonna spy, but the Chinese, if they're gonna spy, are gonna give us a better commercial terms. Um, right? I mean, you can focus on one belt, one road. You can focus on IMF inclusion. You can focus on the fact that the Chinese are doing more externally. They used to say, we're small, we're poor, we don't have the money, we can't be a part of that. They're increasingly not saying that. They are saying they want no part of the geopolitical stuff. They don't, they don't want to fix the refugee problem. When, when Angela Merkel went to the Chinese a few weeks ago and says, help us out with the refugees, they're like, are, are you kidding me? That's not happening, right? I mean, the Chinese aren't itching to be a part of the Syria coalition. Um, but if you ask, do the Chinese feel like they actually want to have real impact on political outcomes around the world and they're gonna challenge US-led global institutions, 
like the IMF, like the World Bank, like the Bretton Woods Accord on currency, where they don't feel like they're, you know, sort of a part, a working part that's respected. Um, I think the answer to that is is not yes, but hell yes. And and in that regard, the IMF is a piece of this. Again, perfectly natural, understandable. I'm not someone who looks at China rising and says, I'm worried about the South China Sea. I actually think that's a comparatively small issue. I was in APEC in Manila. I saw the Philippine president say absolutely nothing about South China Sea while he was hosting Xi Jinping. And I saw Xi Jinping be just as restrained. These are sides that are going to keep doing what they're doing on the ground, but they don't want to ruin their economic relationships. And I also met with a lot of CEOs in the Philippines who speak Mandarin. They're Chinese. They go back and forth. They want the business relationships to go well. I, I think the Chinese, to the extent that we're going to see fundamental conflict from China in the near term, it'll overwhelmingly be geoeconomic. And in part, it's because the United States is, and the Chinese both see themselves as exceptional powers in very different directions. And there's virtually no dialogue on this issue. You can see it on cyber which is fundamentally not going to be a big conflict on the national security side geopolitically, but it will be in terms of industrial espionage. And that deal that was signed between the Americans and the Chinese is, not, is barely worth the paper it was printed on. Certainly, no, no one expects it's truly going to be upheld, as you've heard from U.S. officials in the past weeks. Let one of the things that we have to note that, on top of that is that the global financial industry is still really U.S. dominant be it the capital market, be it the rulemaking of the Basel III. But uh, utilizing LMB in IMF is going to be one of the small but uh, uh, meaningful process to put the uh, Chinese influence into the financial industry, which is going to have a, a fundamental impact in the next 10 years, I believe. Let me ask a, a question of Dr. Bremer, if I may. Um, China's progress, certainly over the past 30 or 40 years, has been astonishing. But what do you see as the vulnerabilities of China? I mean, China is now undergoing a major transition and slowing down from an industrial-led economy to a supposedly a services-led economy. Um, this is bound to have some impact on the rate of, at which China is going to take over the world, so to speak. So where do you think the vulnerabilities are in, in that? And if I could ask Mutachi-san, too, a question about, you talked about you know disaster prevention and so on. And you mentioned supply chains. Well, it's a, it's a most interesting point, but is the cost of preparing for these disasters not greater than the actual cost of dealing with them when they come? If you're going to reorganize your supply chains, it's going to be an enormous disruption and a very costly exercise. So does the cost outweigh the benefit? Okay. So, I mean, I, I certainly, I think the likelihood of China taking over the world is roughly zero. Um, I. You know, this, it's very clear that, again, the power expresses itself uh, in, in terms of the economy and specifically in terms of geoeconomics and the marriage of a, a, an economy that will be the world's largest with a government that is specifically created um, to actually project that kind of power. Um, having said that, um, the, the, the challenges and uncertainties of the kind of transformation that is required of China's economy while they attempt to maintain hegemony of the Chinese Communist Party in political power um, in a relatively short period of time with a, a, in, a, in a government of that size is historically unprecedented. Um, uh, you know, clearly you can focus on the environment um, and anyone that saw Beijing pictures yesterday would do so. Um, it, clearly you can focus on uh, demographics and the fact that the one child policy was made into a two child policy decades too late to have any impact whatsoever. Um, you can focus um, on, um, the, uh, on, the, on the demands of an increasingly urbanized and wealthier elite in parts of China who will have much greater uh, appetite for political liberties and more responsive governance at the same time that other parts of China will have no interest in that whatsoever and will just want growth. And how does the Chinese government manage that? And so I think that as you get more than five years out, probably more than 10 years out, I think 10 to 20 is the real danger period, um, you, you start realizing that the, the fundamental sustainability of the Chinese model is really open to question. And so that's why I say longer term, the uncertainties around where China's gonna go means that anybody thinking long term about how you invest has to be incredibly cautious about China. Of course, most people that say they're investing long term really aren't. Um, and so there's that. Um, but I guess of the things that worry me 
in the shorter term, the one that I would pay most attention to would be how technology disintermediates the productivity of emerging market middle classes. I mean, Piketty, most of you know, wrote that book on capital, on inequality, growing inequality. He just yesterday, unfortunately, said that he thinks that inequality is what's behind the rise of ISIS. Kind of when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail theory. Um, but uh, he'll, I hope he backs off of that one. Um, but I mean, the fact is, that when he talked about inequality, he was really just talking about the hollowing out of the world's very wealthy. Um, because he was really just talking about Europe and the United States, a bit of Japan. He wasn't talking about emerging market middle classes, which are the true global middle classes, who have done incredibly well with globalization. That's because, of course, with globalization, um, you know, uh, Chinese labor can eat American labor's lunch. But American technology and global technology can also eat Chinese labor's lunch. And that comes fastest. And that's the one that I would start worrying about in five years' time to maybe ten. Not in one or two, in part because we're not there yet, and in part because the Chinese as an authoritarian system have political mechanisms they can use to forestall this, and they will. So again, the issue for me is purely one of timing. But my God, timing matters. And if we know that for the next five years, yeah, China's slowing, but they're going to be the largest economy, and they're still going to be quite politically stable. There's going to be no fundamental internal challenges to their system over the period of this 13th five-year plan. Um, I think we have to act that way. Um, that would be my baseline. So anyway, that's, it's a tough question, but that's, uh, those are my general views. So there's two things. One is building upon what uh, Ian had just said. We all know that the Chinese population is going to be declined starting sometime in the 2030s. And the changing point for Japanese economy was 1997, when the actual population started to decline. So uh, if it were not for any, quote unquote, digital product, uh, productivity boost, which is yet to come, frankly speaking, we need to figure out how to grow the economy with the declining population. Comes Japan first, Korea second, and China. So. That's the timing issues, what matters. And going back to your question, I think uh, people, if you believe in uh, financial theory, uh, there is the saying, no risk, no gain, right? Risk taking is the way you can earn profit. But is it infinite growth? Nobody believes in that. If it's infinite, the larger the risk, the larger the profit, you are going to bet on, bet on, bet on. But it's actually it's going to be more of that shape. Why? Any one company can stand for certain risks beyond its uh, balance sheet power. So you need to figure out what is your limit. In saying that, many companies are talking about portfolio of investment. But in, in reality, there is a portfolio of procurement sources, portfolio of manufacturing basis, portfolio of demand basis. If you take a look at the portfolio basis uh, theory, you need to figure out in which region you are too much dependent at this moment. So there is a certain insurance cost you need to play with with a portfolio play, which capital market is doing uh, efficiently, but the no industrial companies are doing efficiently at this moment. Okay. Um, yes. Yes. Sorry. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. My name is Errol Emmet. I'm an editor for the TTSOJ's uh, Commerce uh, Industry Magazine. Also, I have a um, consultancy and research from two questions. One is, Mr. Abe is, uh, you know, um, traveling around the world. Apparently, he's got the uh, title of the, I think he's the most uh, traveled Japanese prime minister, apparently trying to mimic the Chinese because they're also traveling around the world. How much is he being successful uh, in trying to win contracts away from the China, from Chinese. The second question, how does India fit into the whole, this picture? Thank you. You do Abe, I do India? Okay, you do Abe first. No, we are three. Uh, if you take a look at uh, the scorecard uh, from the actual number of contracts, very small, frankly speaking. But I think, uh, personally, this is my personal opinion, uh, it counted. If you uh, really imagine if uh, Abe-san has not traveled that much. Obviously, it's a function of his longevity, frankly speaking. But uh, uh, the impact of a Japanese corporation trying to uh, invest more and in globally, including their very poor emerging countries near zero. 
I think it, it mattered a lot. Think about the ticket. It is a political uh, festivities uh, long before, but now it's a real business game. If you look at the ticket, every time Japanese corporations are there are talking about the infrastructure business and things like that, which made a huge difference. So I think uh, I'm not agreeing on 100% of everything Abe-san has done, but for that, and also for the population stuff, I think uh, I would like to uh, put the high marks. If it were not for that, I think Japanese corporations were more look inward. The only thing they could do is just uh, give the excess caps back to the shareholders rather than investment, frankly. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly uh, strongly second the notion that when your population is shrinking, uh, your head of state should be traveling outside your country. Uh, I think that's generally true. Um, the, um, the India story, um, clearly long term, the competition for China's India. Uh, from a commodities demand perspective, from a direct security perspective in terms of the likely growth of India's military, um, borders, I mean, you, you name it. And the fact that India now has a leader who can lead, who is charismatic, who has young people behind him, who has who is not corrupt in any way, shape, or form, which for India is breathtaking, um, and is actually running his party um, in a way that is more or less functional, which you've never seen before either. Um, and I do think that this is a sea change for India because, I mean, look, you had 180 million Indians that were eligible to vote for the first time in this last election. I mean, having a population that's average age is under 30 can do that for you. The country can change quickly, much more quickly than the U.S. or than Japan because there are so many young people that are just coming into positions of power very quickly. So this means that even if Modi flames out, even if he can't get it done, even if it turns out that you know, ultimately the challenges from too many holdouts in the Congress party and too much difficulty in decentralization, the grassroots changes in India over the next 10 years are gonna be incredibly dramatic and I would bet on them. Um, having said, and so that certainly means that long term China's gonna see a much more direct security threat from a country like India than one like Japan that's never gonna truly militarize, that's incredibly wealthy on a per capita basis, that's not gonna use more and more commodities and um, that you know, frankly, has just a much less competitive skill set in terms of where you're producing and what kind of industries you have than the Chinese and the Indians are going to be in. Um, and, and, and frankly, it also, one of, it's one of the reasons, there, we talked about the domestic reasons why China will not take over the world, but I mean, China can't even take over the region long term. You, the, what we're likely to see is either a breakdown of state power, which is clearly possible globally, and you see the beginnings of this. If the G0 persists, you've got a meeting in Paris in the same way that ISIS is getting stronger because states aren't leading. But so is Bill Gates and CEOs that come to the COP21 meeting and they say, you know what, if our governments won't do it, the private sector will do something. So that's okay, right? Um, but you know, in, in the same way that you see um, that, so one, one possibility is states just really break down. The other possibility that seems to be emerging um, is that we just end up with a much more multipolar system. But that, that system is going to look very different in different regions of the world. In Asia, it's going to be truly messy and multipolar. In the Middle East, it will, it will have a, more and more of a power vacuum, where in the Western Hemisphere, it will be largely US dominated. And the real question is, what is it going to look like in Europe, given what I just said about the Middle East? And I, I suspect nothing good. Um, but we'll see on that. Okay. Um, someone had their hand raised. Um, yes, yes. But, um, first working press, if not. All right, gentlemen over there. Yes, you, yes. Uh, I am Khalil Hassan. I'm Ambassador of Bahrain. Oh, every time I read for you, I listen to you, really your discussion squeezed my mind so much you know, just to come with, I think you have very brilliant uh, all the time discussions. Uh, the Soviet Union, they thought their uh, threat is external. But at the end, what destroyed the Soviet Union was internal threat. Now, we are talking that geoeconomics, and our threat is China. But 
Isn't it we are looking at things like the Soviet Union before? We are looking at external threat, but we are forgetting our internal threat. Now, I know capitalism, we need inequality because we need competition, we need innovativeness. But when the danger is poverty, my question is, I think there's a huge inequality there at uh, global level, at uh, Western level, and at other levels. As you know, it, I don't want to mention the numbers, but it's huge. Now, do you don't, don't think that if this inequality associated with poverty, that would be a huge, huge internal threat than China? Thank you, sir. Uh, that's a great question, and I'm not just saying that because you said I was brilliant, <laughs> though, <laughs> though I, I admit it has an influence. Um, uh, the, um, of course I agree with you that the internal threat matters. And I, ultimately, it's the internal threat in China that co that's going to po pose so much uncertainty for the Japanese though clearly of a very different sort than we saw in the Soviet Union, um, the nationalities issue relevant there. But I, I got to tell you, when I see issues of inequality, again, timing matters. When does that inequality pose an internal threat? Greece has just gone through a depression. Over 50% of the Greek youth are unemployed of working age. Uh, general unemployment's over 25%. They've suffered a type of austerity that is vastly worse than that of any other developed economy in the world. And yet the amount of actual social instability and violence in Greece is virtually zero. And the reason for that is because Greece is still a developed economy. Families still function, they have money, people are not starving, there's a relative political apathy compared to countries across the Mediterranean. I would argue that when the Eurozone crisis hit, the impact was on your part of the world, on the Middle East, particularly North Africa. Think about it, right? The Europeans suddenly didn't have the money. Who were the ones that were funding Tunisia and Egypt? Where did the trade come from? Europe, it wasn't the United States. Where did the aid come from? Mostly Europe. Remittances from Tunisians and Egyptians that lived in Europe went back there. The tourism came from Europe. So Europe fell apart, and the Tunisians and Egyptians who were living much closer to the poverty line, they were the ones that, of course, exploded. So inequality, sir, is absolutely the issue, but inequality is really vastly more of an issue at countries where you were living much closer to baseline poverty. And that's why I'm so worried in the nearer term about what happens with technology expanding inequality in emerging markets, which can much less afford it. The levels of inequality in the United States are, are disgusting from the perspective of an American that actually lives there and cares about his country's values. And yet, you know, we just had a midterm election where fewer people actually voted than at any time since World War II, and people were busy then. If you get rid of that election, you have to focus to the mid-19th century. In other words, the level of political apathy in the United States to change the level of inequality that present exists is enormous. I mean, I can pretend that that's gonna have an enormous impact on destabilizing America, but that would be irresponsible of me. In reality, most Americans don't care. And, um, and I think that we can persist that way for quite some time. I don't believe that that can persist in emerging and frontier markets. And so I think your point on asking about inequality is, and poverty is really important. I have to say one other thing though, especially since you're coming from the Gulf. And that's that let's recognize that poverty comes in many forms. There's poverty of, um, of, of economics, and there's also poverty of social opportunity. And I do worry that in the Middle East that a lot of young men and women who feel like they not only do not have economic ability to improve themselves, but also cannot entertain themselves, cannot um, you know, sort of act as young men and women wish to, 
um, the incredible uh, conservatism that is pervasive um, in some of these societies is one that also is facilitating um, a lot of behavior that's very destabilizing as well. And I, I think we'd be loath not to recognize the impact that can have in that region and more broadly. Yes. Okay, good afternoon. This is Andy Sharp from Bloomberg. Um, just quickly, what would you say is behind the relatively warm ties between Abe Putin, Japan, Russia? Is this some kind of buffer against Russia? Um, sorry, some kind of buffer against China and its growing you know, influence in the region? Maybe a question to both of you. Yeah. Okay, both of us. Okay, I'll start. Mm. Um, well, I mean, from Putin's perspective, they really don't want China to be their only major option. And the United States leading a policy of we will punish you, we will isolate you, means that the Americans and the Europeans had suddenly turned the Russians off, the Chinese were turning them on. What we do know from China is that if you are over a barrel with the Chinese, they will help you out uh, at their advantage. Uh, they know how to drive great commercial terms for them. And the Russians uh, understand when they're getting squeezed. Uh, Putin has historically viewed the Japanese as essentially a check writing machine and not very geopolitically relevant. Um, but, but Putin is much more interested in Japan strategically when his options are more limited. And I think that, you know, there's been this sense that there's no, that there's no way that you can cut a deal with Putin on the islands. Uh, that's a lot of Americans talking a lot of smack. If Putin wants to cut a deal on the islands, Putin can cut a damn deal on the islands. It, it's, it's got 90% approval. I, I mean, th this, this guy has shown he can do all sorts of things the Americans don't expect him to do, right? And so I wouldn't listen to Washington on that. I think if Abe, Abe thinks, from my perspective, that there's, I mean, number one, certainly, you know, the Japanese are looking for markets and Russia's a non-Chinese market. China plus one, go anywhere you want. Russia's not the best market in the world. A lot of companies have figured that out. A lot of Japanese firms realize that it's really corrupt and kleptocratic and, you know, the population's not great and it's really focused on mineral uh, wealth. Um, but but if, the, if the, there's an opportunity here, I think they sense it. And I also think that Abe is right to see how much flexibility there is on something that would be a massive win for him from a nationalist perspective. I wouldn't give away the store for it, but I'd at least test the waters. That's, that's my view. And obviously, on top of uh, the Northern Islands, there is an issue of energy security for Japanese. We all know that on top of natural gas, there is a possibility even the importing electricity, which uh, SoftBank Sonsan has uh, once uh, uh, propagated. I think uh, uh, there is a huge reason that the uh, current Abe's administration is at least keep discussing with the President Putin about the possible cooperation uh, beyond the island. And obviously, as uh, Ian alluded, I think uh, I strongly remember when he mentioned that there are three uh, politicians who are political uh, very stable for the time being. One is Xi Jinping, the other Putin, and another is Abe San. So those three gentlemen uh, obviously have the very strong foothold uh, domestically, meaning that they could play with uh, many more options than many other uh, politicians who are less uh, you know, st stabilized in terms of domestic political sense. Am I right? Okay. Um, sorry, you've had one question. Yes. Uh, uh, Daniel Lessing, uh, AFP. Uh, my question is for Mr. Bremer. Um, the United States and 11 countries recently uh, uh, ended the negotiations successfully for uh, a free trade agreement, so-called the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, can you talk a little bit about the degree of enthusiasm of political leaders in Tokyo and Washington uh, for 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 passing this deal through, uh, uh, through their parliaments. And uh, the fact that it doesn't include China, uh, to what extent do you think it will help to, uh, to, to get the deal passed? Or to what extent do you think it will be a stumbling block? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll let Matachi-san answer on the Japanese side of that. Um, 
you know, I, I firmly believe, and I'm on record saying this in the U.S., that, uh, and I said it to Mike Froman two weeks ago at APEC, who I have a lot of respect for. Uh, I actually think he's the most effective U.S. member of cabinet that Obama has this second term. Um, and he had a lot more the first term. Uh, second term has been harder. Um, that uh, the successful conclusion on TPP, which will happen, will be seen as Obama's by far most significant and successful foreign policy legacy over eight years. Um, Iran deal, more complicated, maybe number two. Cuba, maybe number three. But TPP, absolutely number one. And I, I think there is a lot of enthusiasm for it in Washington, even though no one in Congress wants to give you know, the other party any credit for anything and any wins. Um, I, I think this is, gets done um, in the same way the Trade Promotion Authority got done. Uh, Hillary Clinton, of course, is now opposed to TPP, even though she was uh, one of the architects of it. Uh, and that's because she's running for president. I loved it when she said that uh, we, she, she actually said it was the gold standard of trade deals. And apparently now, well, you know, the U.S. left the gold standard in 1933. So, I mean, you know, we, we passed this up. Um, but, no, I mean, the reality is the fact that, that Hillary doesn't like it tells you nothing about her real position. It just says that she's running for office. Um, I, I'm not worried about this. There's a lot of enthusiasm. They understand it's important. Your China point is really relevant. I don't think of TPP as fundamentally a trade deal. It's actually not that interesting from a trade perspective, certainly not for the U.S. It's a standards deal. It is a recognition that in the G0 world, you can no longer have US-led global institutions. You can either have global institutions that have no leadership, or you have institutions that have leadership but aren't global. So you can't do Doha round, doesn't work. But you can do TPP, which is 40% of the world's GDP and has American leadership. And the reason that's great for China, for relations with China, as opposed to all the things that I can complain about, like AIB and the Americans staying out and Exim Bank and all the rest, is because the Chinese, when they first heard about TPP, they opposed it because they thought it would go away. Now that they understand it's happening, they're studying it. They want to figure out how they can eventually align with it, join it, because you know you don't beat the Chinese by by containing or encircling them. They're too big to contain. You beat the Chinese by building things that are so cool that they want to be a part of it, like Harvard, right? Like, everyone and their mother in China wants their kids to go to Harvard, right? That, that works. Or New York real estate, right? And TPP is like that. The Chinese are not going to want to be left out of those trade and capital flows and those standards that countries that perform well and perform aspirationally as well as the Chinese eventually want to get to, they know they need to do that. So I, I see the TPP as exactly the kind of economic statecraft that the Americans need to do. Unfortunately, TPP is completely untethered to any other parts of US foreign policy. It stands all by itself. Uh, there, there is not, there is an absence of US foreign policy strategy right now. There is, uh, over the last 25 years since the Soviet Union collapsed, there was risk averse, and then when something big happens, overreact. Risk averse, overreact, right? Al Qaeda, 9-11. Ebola, no attention, one, one American shows up with Ebola, our hair's on fire, right? Risk aversion, overreact, that's not strategy. And TPP is a wonderful exception to that rule where you can actually do something big and strategic, but it's, but it's precisely how unusual it is that, that, that proves the broader rule. And on the Japan side, let me go to Nakatacha. Well, I, I don't have to repeat, but uh, yeah, that's true that uh, Japan, obviously, uh, current administration is quite enthusiastic. And let alone trade and capital flow, and also some uh, geopolitical concerns vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, uh, particularly OSEP is now going to be influenced a lot. Uh, they can't just ignore the rules set by uh, U.S. and 11 countries. So OSEP is going to be, to, to some extent, uh, more focused on a service agreement uh, uh, than uh, merely uh, the, the hard goods trade. But I think one of the, the political issues we need to be aware of that it, this is a great opportunity for current administration to transform the long awaited agricultural reform. This, in essence, forced Japan's sentiment. There is no waiting time for agriculture to be, cha agriculture to be changed. We knew that it should happen but we waited for so long. So TPP is going to be a key lever for administration to start discussing about the policy changes. Just quickly raise a point there. Um, 
is, isn't the OBOR, the One Belt, One Road, um, that Dr. Bremer referred to, in a sense, a kind of counter to TPP? I mean, uh, this is a very broad vision. The, the, the idea is, is not only to build highways, railroads, and so on, right across the European continent from Asia, uh, across Eurasia to Europe. It's also to create all kinds of industrial complexes along the route, um, and uh, which will require all kinds of human resources and natural resources. It's a huge vision on the part of China. Now, what, how do you assess that? I mean, first, do you think it's sort of a, a pipe dream? And secondly, if it does come to pass, what, what will be its impact on the geoeconomics of the world generally? Um, either person. Okay. Um, I don't think it's a pipe dream. I, I think, um, I mean, clearly the Chinese will overshoot um, and they'll overpromise, underdeliver. When they're building that kind of big, uh, you know, uh, 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 infrastructure, uh, you know, anyone that goes to Addis Ababa and sees the Chinese-built um, African Union headquarters, uh, which is already falling apart, um, <laughs> African leaders are not happy about this, right? They see it, and it's embarrassing. That's one of the ones you think they'd want to get right. And I mean, certainly, you know, when the Chinese are building and sending off their own Shinkansen, which looks suspiciously like Japanese Shinkansen, um, but theirs um, actually do kill people. Um, you know, that, that, that won't go over well um, in a lot of these countries. So, I mean, clearly, you know, they're doing it on the cheap, and as a consequence, it's, they're not going to be as resilient. But in the context where no one else is coming close to writing those kind of checks in those sorts of countries, it's going to work. You know, I look at Pakistan, and the Pakistanis told Saudi Arabia, Saudi was asking them to help out with the war in Yemen, and Pakistan said, no, thank you. Pakistan, historically, is kind of tied at the hip with the Saudis, but you know when the Chinese government comes in and offers you $55 billion for infrastructure, and the Saudis are playing with $40 oil, I know who I'm going to listen to if I'm Pakistan. And so, yeah, I, I think this is, it is audacious, and it is, it is an enormous challenge, um, but it's going to work, and it's going to work in the same way that, for, for some of the same reasons the Marshall Plan worked, was at the time, no one else was doing it, the Americans were there, they wrote big checks, and the Europeans, you know, signed on board. Now, the different thing, the, the reason that this is different from the Marshall Plan is because the Chinese are not trying to create a Washington consensus. The Chinese are not trying to create um, a, set, you know, a set of shared values and norms that will replace the Americans. The Chinese are really doing this to create a, a whole bunch of very strong bilateral relationships where the Chinese are stronger. They're not really interested in true multilateralism. Um, and in part, that shouldn't be surprising because they're still very clearly not number one. And that is a, that's the appropriate game theoretic strategy to take when you're doing that. Um, it's also uh, one when you have a set of values and norms that don't necessarily appeal to a lot of the other countries that you're actually dealing with. Um, uh, the thing that the Chinese need to worry about is that they end up being most effective in countries that are themselves most brittle authoritarian um, and, and least developed. Um, I mean, you don't want to end up where you've put you know, your biggest risks in a portfolio that itself you'd like to think gets you the biggest reward, as Matachi-san said, but in reality ends up just being the crappiest portfolio. Um, and China does have to worry much more about the external political risk of their investments with the One Belt, One Road policy than anything the Americans or the Japanese have done in the past decades. It's a tough question. So I think it's uh, the question to be answered in the future if the quality of the infrastructure investment is going to be getting better or not. We don't know yet. But apparently, the political, uh, apart from the political motives of China, uh, many, many, many countries really do want their infrastructure. No question about it. So I think it's, uh, uh, the, to me, frankly speaking, the concept is Grandeurs and uh, not bad. Uh, if can, they can deliver, that's the question. Obviously, a political motive comes from the three main reasons, energy security and food security and also market access. Mm -hmm. At least the third one is going to be guaranteed for Chinese for that uh, bilateral relationship. So that's kind of a proxy for the multilateralism. So we are, uh, what we are really uh, going to look at is, as he said, if we really would like to uh, enhance the free trade economy in the world, how we can put it into the multilateral framework, uh, including the rule setting for AIIB and others, which is going to be, by the way, happen in the future, not now. So it's not the, 
And I, I also want to say, I think it bears, it should be obvious, but I think it bears saying out loud that I really don't believe that screw the Americans is in any way a first order priority for the Chinese government, right? It's, it's purely a second order manifestation from things they're trying to accomplish. Where for the Russians, it's a first order priority, <laughs> right? I, I, and, and, and I think that there are a lot of people in the US, in the Defense Department, other places that actually do believe that there is some Chinese kind of um, nefarious scheme to undermine American foreign policy for the sake of doing that. I, and, I, and I really don't believe the Chinese are there. I just think that there are a set of, it's a, it's a geopolitical and geoeconomic position and a set of values that are incompatible um, and priorities that are incompatible among two different countries that are really bad at seeing the world from other countries' shoes. I mean, if, if this was the same economic and geopolitical position but in, it was instead of being the United States and China, it was Canada and Bhutan. I think we could figure this out, right? I, I, so in other words, I think culture does matter. I think you know what these nations are, exceptionalism of American and Chinese in the political systems really adds to the urgency of spending more time working this through. Okay. Um. Sorry, you've had, uh, who's the gentleman behind? Uh, you are working press, I can't see. You're not. Uh, okay, one more from um, this and then we'll come to you. We have a little time. You said you weren't going to talk a lot about climate change, but as we were talking about China, uh, can we talk about climate change? How serious do you think they are about their commitments? Uh, and that goes from anything to financing coal plants overseas to cutting their own coal use. Um, and just quickly, given your comments about Chinese infrastructure, do you worry about them building nuclear plants in the UK? I think the Brits should be more worried about them building nuclear plants in the UK. And the Sorry, fact that they're not, not is, yeah, I mean, no, and this is the thing. I mean, when you ask, is one belt, one road going to work or be grandiose? And when the Brits say you can build a nuclear plant, then clearly, like, if you're Burkina Faso, it's like open day, right? Whatever you want is yours. Uh, the Venezuelans, I mean, they have no other choice. They're just going to China. The number of countries that are going to see China as the only option. You know, it's one thing to complain when you have options. When you have one option, like if you, as a company, if you only have one client, it's, they say jump, you say how high? And that's kind of what the Chinese are playing one belt, one road into. I believe the Chinese are incredibly serious about climate. Um, they're incredibly serious about dealing with their dirty coal. But we also have to recognize that they have a country where 500 million Chinese living in the interior and in the north and the west who want growth and aren't yet living at Shanghai type standards and they want to improve their living for their kids and they don't care if they work overtime and they don't care if coal takes five years off their life as long as their kids can have a better position than they do. The, the Chinese government has to respond to them too. And you know, the, you know, I gotta tell you, for me, climate, as much as I want to focus on climate, when I think about where we're gonna be in 2050 as a world, um, there are basically three sets of inputs that you can think about. One is everything that we can do, starting in 2016. The second is everything that will come from improved technology that will give us better mechanisms to actually deal with all of this in terms of adaptation and in terms of geoengineering. And the third is everything we learn from the climate as it gets warmer and the feedback loops that come that we haven't figured out yet that we get real-time data from and that really affects the planet. And if you ask me what percentage of the total outcome is the first, everything we do from 2016, I think it's at most 10%. That doesn't mean we should stop doing it. It just means that the impact of us is already kind of too late for a lot of this stuff. Um, and that's really unfortunate. And, and a big part of the reason of that, of course, is China. When, I mean, the Chinese are making, they're doing more on many issues of climate than many other countries in the world, and yet what they're basically saying is, hey, by 2030, we're gonna hit our max. Okay, I mean, I, I was watching some of the, the COP21 footage, and I saw that Germany has this massive installation there that says two degrees centigrade. And I'm like, when, by 2030? I mean, not forever. Well, that's, that's a pipe dream. 
And, you know, the unfortunate thing is, despite the fact that COP21 is going to be productive, it's actually going to be productive. It's going to be useful. But governments have so lied to their populations about how comparatively containable this still is, that as we get the real data, it's going to seem like even the successful stuff is completely unsuccessful. What a bummer. That's another reason I don't like talking about climate. Is because, no, as we talk about China, we're talking about something huge that we can maybe really fix. That we can maybe really make work to all of our advantages. Like, there's still a shot. We talk about climate, I just kind of, I don't like spending time doing stuff where I'm just gonna beat my head against a wall. You know, that, for me, that's just not fun. That's not a good use of my career. Um, I wanna make a difference. And on climate, I don't feel like I can make a difference. On this, I feel like I can. It's probably the most depressing single thing I can say at this meeting, but it's also in some ways the most uplifting, so. Okay, yes, please, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Ian Thomas Sullivan, associate member. I wanted to ask your opinion about the, um, the current state of the EU project. Obviously, you know, they're experiencing a lot of difficulties there at the moment, economic crisis, migration crisis, now terrorism. And if you look at the IMF rebalancing yesterday, they didn't cut Japan back, they actually cut EU back to facilitate the, you know, the, uh, the RMB uh, entry. So I was just, again, if you could just give me your, your um, impressions there, thank you. They, they did, just point of order, they did cut the Japanese back a tad. Yeah, they cut the Europeans back more, of course, um, which strikes me as appropriate. Um, they didn't move the U.S. at all. That's an open, interesting issue. But it, it is our organization, so, you know, so what do you do? Um, <laughs> don't, don't quote that. Um, that, was, that, was, that was sarcasm. Um, uh, when I think... Um, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought completely. We were just question. The EU yeah, the, 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 the Brits as well. Are they sure. What, I, I think that the EU um, is the political issues facing the EU are so much graver than the economic issues facing the EU. Ultimately, we had strong German leadership, and that was and an ECB that was aligned, and that was able to completely backstop every. Cypriot crisis, Greek crisis, Spanish crisis, Italian crisis, you name it. If you have the political will, you can make the economists wrong because you can punish the markets to, to, till they get to your position. Um, the problem now is I'm not sure we're gonna have the same German leadership in another year that we've had for the last 10. Um, I worry that Merkel's position on the refugees, while admirable, is completely politically unrealizable. I worry that the offer that's been made to the Turks um, as, you know, is completely unworkable. Um, I, I, and, and especially because, I mean, when you didn't want the Turks before, and, and, and because you were worried about culture and demographics, and now you're gonna say, let's have them because you can keep the even worse culture and demographics out. It tells you that, well, look, what we're, I'm not worried about the Eurozone falling apart. I'm worried that what the Eurozone used to mean, it won't mean anymore. I mean, Schengen will still exist, right? But it's like the Security Council. The Security Council still exists. It just doesn't do anything, right? You, know, you never get rid of things. Schengen, you can keep Schengen running. The lawyers can keep Schengen running for decades, but it won't work, it won't function. When the Dutch are saying, let's have a mini Schengen that really works, well, it's telling you Schengen doesn't hold anymore. And so, I mean, these values that actually did matter, values of common political, you know, sort of, uh, uh, rule of law um, and and democracy and human rights, I mean, are going the way of the Statue of Liberty in the United States. And I know you asked about Europe, but I mean, my God, I see what's happening in our country right now, in America, and I see the way that you can have a, a, the leading candidate for the Republican nomination right now saying that he will s willingly strip the constitutional rights of every Muslim in America and get applauded and not have other candidates go after him for it. That, that is not the America I grew up in. And, and what I see, in, again, in a G-Zero world is that we are in a race to the bottom in terms of common values. And th that means American foreign policy is gonna look more Chinese and European domestic policy is gonna look more like a lot of emerging markets. And that, we shouldn't like that. 
Uh, Japan has an advantage here because of homogeneity, of course. And other countries in the world do too. Again, Bhutan, I love talking about Bhutan. Um, such a great place. Um, so so non-globalized, <laughs> right? You leave it there. Um, but, uh, but that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of my view on that. It's kind of sad. What? Brexit. I, Brexit's clearly more likely than you'd like it to be. Uh, again, in the absence of German leadership, it's harder to get, even though the Brits, all the, all the demands being made by the Brits, which are soft as hell, can be accepted by the Europeans, but the, willing, the, the leadership to get things done, big things done, is eroding. And you know, Cameron doesn't have a labor challenge, but that means the backbenchers are gonna be a tougher story for him on Brexit too. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet you that Brexit's gonna happen, but I think it's a real I think it's a real possibility of it. And I know that Cameron and Osborne are increasingly very worried about that very fact. So Okay, yes, you have your um, yes, you are you are working press. I'm sorry, yes, yes, please. Uh, thank you for talking. I'm from TVS, Japanese TV station, uh, Masanali Yamaoka. Uh, in the first section, maybe you mentioned about the Japanese future is depends on the U.S. policy in these five years, and uh, I want to know the meaning of that. Seems like uh, it has something to do with the uh, you can't come on saying that your country is moving between the isolationism and commitment. Yes. Yeah, I want to know. And how do you think it's going? Uh, that's my question. Thank. Um, so, I, I, I think that my point here had more to do with the fact that I, I believe that China in the next few years is actually much more stable and defined in terms of its foreign policy. Um, and the United States is trying to figure out. When I go around the world and I talk to foreign ministers of America's allies, um, none of them know what America wants. They don't know what American strategy is. They don't know how committed they are to these countries. I'm not just talking about Japan. I'm talking Canada, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Britain, France, Germany, you name it, right? Um, and um, I think there is a big debate happening in the US elections right now on foreign policy. If you look at the first debates, and there have been far too many of them, um, you, know, you actually see that those are the big questions it's because the Americans have a sense that the rest of the world is not going well, and they don't know what we should do about it. They know that the U.S. is losing a lot of foreign policy influence. They know the Russians are making fools of the Americans. They know um, that Syria has gone very badly. Um, they know that the transatlantic relationship is not what it used to be, and yet they don't really know what they want. And so, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is I think that there's a real debate right now. It's very interesting. Ted Cruz a couple months ago sounded like he wanted to, like, you know, bomb stuff and wave the flag and be the American policeman and be the exceptional, indispensable nation. Yesterday, he sounded a lot more like Rand Paul. And I think in part that's because Trump has tapped into, and Bernie Sanders too, a populist sentiment that trillions of dollars spent on Iraq and Afghanistan forever wars that went very badly. A lot of Americans died. A lot more other people died. And the Americans got nothing out of it. And Syria is a disaster, but it's a lot bigger disaster for a lot of people in the region and the Europeans than it is for the Americans. And, you know, Russia's a real problem for Ukraine. Not clear how much of a problem that is for the U.S. I mean, Germany doesn't even care very much. They weren't willing to pay any money to help the Ukrainians when they could have. So, um, you know, I, I, think that there's, I think that there's a real um, identity crisis going on in terms of America's role in the world. And I think that uh, various candidates are struggling to address that. And if Hillary wins in 2016, then forget that I said anything. Because it's, I mean, people understand what Hillary is going to be like, particularly for this part of the world. The pivot comes back, economic statecraft, the Chinese get a little bit, you know, stroppy, and that's that. But, you know, you end up with some of these Republican candidates, and life could be very different in both directions. And I'm not saying that that means that it would be bad. I'm just saying, because again, it's not like I'm, I'm independent on this stuff. I'm just saying that these are going to be real implications for the world. And I think people don't, people don't necessarily assess how much in flux U.S. foreign policy presently is. Um, sorry, you had your, oh, Stephen, you haven't asked a question. 
Thanks. My name is Stefano Carrer for the Italian Economic Daily. Uh, we cannot avoid to ask you what have changed in uh, your opinion after the ISIS attack in Paris, and how do you see the evolution of uh, the fighting against ISIS? And a more specific question um, regarding my country. There are pressures for Italy to join the new coalition of winning, so start uh, bombing with Italian planes in uh, uh, Iraq and Syria, or there are ideas that Italian soldiers should go back on the former, uh, set foot again on the former colony Libya. Um, don't you think that this could give the ISIS a great tool of propaganda, so to claim that uh, there is a new Christian crusade from Rome? I mean, I mean, it's, it's not an issue regarding only Italy because the Pope just uh, proclaimed the, the Jubilee here, so millions of pilgrims from all around the world will will come to Rome, and so I mean, probably there is a, I mean, there is a safety issue that will be raised if Italy actually will uh, start the bombing in uh, Syria and so on. I mean, look, it, you're Italian. It's okay if the question's all about Italy. I mean, that's that's acceptable, right? I mean, it's it's. I mean, I did write a book called Every Nation for Itself, so I mean, I'm I'm part of this this problem. Um, I look. I, I first of all, the ISIS itself has talked about Rome as where you know sort of the great Satan comes from, as opposed to Al Qaeda, which was always much more focused on you know sort of the original great Satan, uh, my country. Um, when when I um, when I think about um, Post Paris, what it means. My, my surprise um, was, uh, first of all, uh, just how capable ISIS was in organizing under the noses of the French government on highest alert with a new and very advanced surveillance policy that was quite controversial when it came in, much better than anything the other Europeans had as of last May. Huge problem for um, Aland. Now, what I was not surprised by, but very depressed by, is I can't remember another major terrorist attack where the immediate reactions in that country were so divisive and divided. I mean, with Sarkozy, I mean, this is like France's 9-11, and they weren't rallying around. Charlie Hebdo, they rallied around the flag. Six million people came out, the Front National was kept outside, and everyone said, we're all France, we're not afraid. Here, they are afraid, and Sarkozy immediately came out and said, we, we should cancel this COP21 summit. Immediately came out and said, you got 11,000 Muslims on the watch list, we should put them under house arrest and we should put electronic bracelets on them, right? And Aland is saying, no, 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 we gotta stick with letting refugees in. And the Front National is saying, you see, you see, you see, we told you this was gonna happen. Very damaging to the French economy, to the French nation. Very damaging to France's ability to integrate people, which was never very great, uh, but it's getting worse. 8% of the population roughly Muslim. Um, you know, not a surprise they got attacked first in that regard in Europe and biggest, but you know, still not making anybody happy about where we're gonna go. Um, do I think the Italians should bomb? I, no, I don't see why you should get sucked into that. I mean, the Canadian prime minister, the new Canadian prime minister just came out on, on a huge win and said, we're not gonna, we're gonna, actually we were bombing, we're gonna stop bombing but we are gonna take 25,000 refugees, more than the Americans, by the way, which is crazy, but they do have a lot of space. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and, and they also said there was political pressure. They said they're not gonna take uh, individual young men, right? They're gonna take families, they're gonna take children, whatever. But 25,000 for Canada, and they're gonna ramp up their humanitarian aid. Uh, you know, for the Italians, it would be hard for you to say we're gonna take on more refugees because that's a big domestic concern that you already have, given Libya and the rest. But, I mean, I would dramatically step up the humanitarian effort. That's what I would do, and that's needed. Um, and I also think we have to recognize that, you know, in the aftermath of the Paris attacks, 98% of the conversations in the West have been about what do we do militarily, when that is at best 10% of the solution. I mean, the solution is how do you stop the proliferation of an organization like ISIS? What is it that is making all of these young men find this an attractive ideology? How do you create a Sunni alternative in Iraq, in Syria? Um, how do you get um, you know, radical Wahhabist clerics to stop proselytizing hate and exclusionary behavior? How do you track the money? How do you cut it off? 
I mean, those are the things the Italians can and should be very proactive in helping with. And, and I, I think that especially because the Americans and French are really not talking much about those things. Okay, I think we have time for just one more question. Yes, go ahead. We've talked about, you talked about Russia um, and uh, how it's hating the US and the Europeans are um, sort of strong holding tactics. Uh, recently, Turkey down a Russian plane. Is this the Turkey-Russia problem or Russia-NATO problem, Russia-Europe problem, and how, how it's going to develop in your opinion? Thank you. Do I have to pick just one? Canopy? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a pretty big problem, right? It's, um, I mean, look, you, you, what, what basically happened is you took the two largest egos in this region <laughs> and you basically unleashed them on each other, right? I mean, you know, Erdogan, if he could be Putin in Turkey, he would like that. I mean, this is the guy that just built the... 1,000 plus room palace for himself um, that is going after more journalists than anybody else um, in, in the world. Um, and look, it's, it's clear, I, I believe the Russians did violate Turkish airspace, right? But the fact that they shot it down within seconds means that Erdogan was waiting for the next time it happened and he already gave the order, you knock him out of the sky. Um, the Turks invade Greek airspace with regularity as the Greek Prime Minister said. They have not shot down a Turkish plane. Turkey was getting sick of it. And, you know, it could have ended with that, especially when NATO did not provide a lot of support to Erdogan. NATO basically told Erdogan, you idiot, you know, you're causing trouble here. You gotta calm down and work with us, which Erdogan was not happy about. So Erdogan then backed off. First he said, well, you know, if we had known it was a Russian plane, we would have acted differently, we would have warned you differently, which is clearly not true, we knew it was a Russian plane. Then he said, I wanna have a phone call with Putin. Putin didn't say anything. He said, no, I wanna meet him in Paris. Putin didn't say anything. Then he announced that he regretted it. Putin didn't say anything. But see, Putin went a little, went a little off, off script. Putin actually said, you know, there's a new cabinet in Turkey and the new minister of uh, energy, petroleum, is uh, Erdogan's son-in-law. And Putin directly blamed him for, for taking ISIS oil and, and funding ISIS. And I don't think Erdogan can back down after that. So I don't think you can fix this soon. Um, uh, I do think that both sides are not looking for a fight both sides certainly want to keep the economics functional, so the, most of the trade is going to keep going. Certainly, the Russians aren't going to cut off the gas to Turkey, but you're not going to fix this relationship too soon. The egos are too large. Um, it is less of a NATO problem, precisely because NATO is increasingly ineffectual. The French, on this issue, the French didn't go to NATO. The French went to the Europeans because the French were working more closely with the Russians and the Americans weren't, so they knew that NATO was in a sense, too inclusive to get anything done on this issue. Unfortunate, but true. Uh, the Russians right now are the dominant military player outside of the region on Syria. Um, and they're in part because they are playing with Assad. The Americans are increasingly playing a marginal role. And the Americans have to decide how much more they want to get sucked in. Obama would like to get less sucked in. Um, they just announced today, Secretary Carter, that they're going to put an expeditionary force on the ground in Iraq. So more special forces. But my God, they're getting sucked in slowly. And that is the Obama strategy. It is a strategy on Syria and Iraq is get sucked in as slowly as humanly possible. Because it is going to get worse and they don't believe they have any good outcomes. That, is, that may not be a great strategy. It is not the worst strategy. I can think of like 10 strategies that are being thrown around by candidates that are actually much worse, but all of them that are much worse than that. So, but it is also true that Obama's strategy does not destroy ISIS and does not remove Assad, which are the two things he said they were going to do. Um, and so the fact that Obama continues to talk about aspirations as if they were policy, like Russia must leave Ukraine, that's not a policy, that is an aspiration. And it would be good if like Obama just said, look, we have the following aspirations, they're like Ban Ki-moon's aspirations, like we wanna end global climate change, stuff like that. They're not meant to be taken seriously, but they're guidelines, they're philosophical, right? So we have those, and then we have policies, right? And if we could do that, I think we'd be in better shape. So that's a good one to end on, I think. That's good, okay. You can, you are. <laughs>
Thank you very, very much, both of you. A fascinating discussion. Actually, I was covering a, a cyber security conference in um, Okinawa a yeah. couple of weeks ago, and I gather there's a, a, um, a desire there to have a, a series of mini Davos types of, yes. um, in Okinawa. But uh, I would suggest that you know this club would be a very good forum for these yes. mini Davoses, and certainly if we do have that, we'll certainly invite both of you gentlemen to be speakers. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, as usual, as a gesture of our Thanks. We would like to offer you a one-year honorary membership, Natachi-san. So and um, Dr. Ramy, you've been here a number of occasions, so it's just a matter of renewing the Thank membership. You Thank you very much.